Amanda is leading discussion today. What? This I didn't send out the papers. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how this is going, huh? <laughs> do, why? Do you have thoughts on the papers, Amanda? Not really. Should I? Do I have to have thoughts? What are thoughts again? T- typically in a discussion, people have ideas that they want to talk about. I don't know. Probably. <laughs> and this is the intro. <laughs> and now it's not the intro because you just said, and this is the intro over Amanda talking. You cut that part out and put the music in. No, I can't because you interrupted Amanda. No, he didn't. It it that was the lag. Yeah, but when I correct for the lag, he interrupted you. <laughs> oh. Good times. Hey guys, welcome to Paleo After Dark, your bi-weekly um semi-scientific paleontology podcast. Um you're here with uh, James uh, Randall. Randall. Yep. Kurt and Amanda. Yep. Still via Skype. Yep. Yep. And uh yep, we're talk What are we talking about today, Curtis? Uh, today, well, uh, today we're going to be talking about a few studies that have been looking at uh, trying to get at habitat tolerance or, or habitat breadth as a means of looking at survivability. So, um, how many people here have read the papers? I have gone through the papers a couple of times, but it hasn't been in-depth reading. It's been kind of more of a light skim. Okay, well, as far as the general gist, can you give me an uh, do, do you know the can you give me a general idea of what actually is happening with that stuff? Well, the one is a discussion of um uh late Ordovician mass extinction looking at sort of like a, a habitat um uh god, I can't think of the word. Um tolerances? Yeah, I guess that's the word. And looking at, you know, sort of extinction rates and sort of correlating them to habitat tolerance and things like that. The other one that I rem- uh, the other one I can't remember the age on for some reason. I'm just completely blanking. Uh, it's, it's just looking- it's the entirety of the Mesozoic. It's the entirety of the Mes. That's right. That's right. Because they're talking about Triassic and Jurassic, um, and then looking at um, both origination and extinction rates um, throughout the entire Mesozoic. Both using genus level, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, everything here is ultimately using genus level. I guess yep. that's what we're going to be talking about. I mean, it's an element that we can definitely <laughs> talk about, but I think uh, we can argue to the blue in the face, and that they certainly, the second paper with the Mesozoic, makes some strong arguments for why genus data is biologically meaningful and maybe more so than species data. Mm-hmm. Now, they don't really necessarily say more so, but rather say that they make some <laughs> assumptions that it will solve problems that the species data will have uh-huh. um, which I think is potentially problematic and potent- but at the same time if we take their patterns at face value the results that they get are still something interesting and right. we can discuss why it's important what, what, what the difficulties are when you're dealing with generic data versus species data and at the same time we can discuss the difficulties of using species level data as well because Let's be honest, we're occasionally going to make mistakes with our species designations over split or over lump, and we'll discuss kind of what that stuff means. But I, I guess the, the key thing that I, uh, that I wanted to get through with, the, with these papers in the very beginning is that both of these looked at trying to get at a more fundamental question that has been on biology and particularly uh, the interests of paleontologists for some time, which is trying to sort of get at through various different degrees, the effects that uh, being environmentally generalized versus being environmentally specialized have on your evolutionary history. Right. Um, so the the first study looked at uh, the end or division, and it didn't just look at uh, sort of a proxy for habitat breadth. It also looked at um, the truncation of the sedimentary package to see whether or not, like, habitat, to try and catalog habitat loss, like, 
uh, and try and also tease that apart from mistaken extinction where you're, uh, you're no longer preserved and maybe your group survives, but the areas where it was in just weren't preserved or have been eroded away. Right. They did uh, a lot of work on that in that paper, and that was actually pretty cool in my opinion. They looked at quite an area. Yeah, they did a they did a series of of models and uh, correlation testing to try and see which uh, which things were most strongly correlated, and uh, they they definitely showed some correlations with habitat loss. Like the things that are experiencing truncations of their habitat are more likely to be going extinct, but they also showed that um, paleolatitudinal extent. So. If the if the group uh, okay, assuming this genus is a real monophyletic clade, if that whole evolutionary group has a paleolatitudinal range that is very large and extends many different sort of potentially climatic regimes, then it was more likely to survive the extinction event than if it was more narrow and just restricted, like let's say to the tropics. Right, and that's a, that's something that's pretty standard knowledge, right? Everybody. I mean, gen generalists survive, things that are very specialized tend not to once the shit hits the fan, essentially. Well, this is this is like the, the key question that these people are getting at with, uh, like, questions that Simpson originally proposed and even goes up to, like, Verba and various mm -hmm. other uh, ecologists, ecologists as well, is these differences, almost like trade-offs between how you adapt yourself to sur uh, how how individual species are adapted to their environment mm -hmm. like special uh the 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 old adage and it's this is one of the things that uh i guess i think it's verba in 1987 came up with was this notion of uh stenotopic versus uretopic uh regimes where you had these groups of species that were highly specialized and were stenotopic and that the trade-off was they tended to speciate more easily but they also at the same time were more likely to go extinct yeah. it has mm -hmm. been it's been suggested by some people that generalists will survive but they won't speciate specialists will speciate a lot and then it's when a specialist reverts back to being a generalist that you get a, a widespread new form yeah so that basic idea is kind of at play with this sort of vision paper potentially where you have something that is exhibiting that is living in a much larger habitat or not a habitat is living in many different regimes many different climatic bands and because it's more spread out there it, when temper when the climate changes and things go crazy it's living in more places and that's an interesting that the, the this is interesting because this is um, the second paper, as we'll get into, uh, discusses whether or not they would use this particular metric, and they deny they don't use this metric because they say that it is also unfortunately intrinsically linked with geographic range, mm -hmm. which is you could make the argument that paleo latitude is an example uh, or, or 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 is intrinsically due to their uh, their I guess flexibility of their niche space. They can live in many different areas, but you could also just make the argument of they have a larger paleolatitudinal extent because they're just living in a larger range. Mm -hmm. And uh, sure. this gets into another issue or another question that has been used for survivability of extinction events, which is just that uh, typically the pattern is assumed that uh, species that have larger ranges or groups that have larger ranges tend to survive extinction events better than things that are more endemic, things that have smaller ranges and are restricted to certain areas. And the basic right. idea here is that when the shit hits the fan, if all of your habitat disappears when you're living in just one little island, you're fucked. Yes, exactly. But if you're living on an entire continent and the entire eastern seaboard gets blown up by a giant crater, maybe you're fine further west. Right, and that's why area uh th especially this is an obviously a bird example but when you get um uh isolated island arcs island habitats you get very high rates of speciation but your rates of extinction are also very high true yes mm -hmm. um so this first paper was just specifically looking at extinction preference um the second paper was interesting because the second paper which was looking at mesozoic mollusks uh, was actually looking to see whether or not this idea, this core concept that generalists not only survive longer but also speciate less, is actually valid. 
And uh, as opposed to using paleolatitudinal extent, they looked at uh, these differences. They, they, they sort of tried to metric out uh, habitat changes. Like they, they gave numeric coding for if it was in like multiple types of substrate versus if it was in multiple types of... of... So the biggest extent being, you know... Yeah, grain, yeah, yeah. Bathymi bathymetry elements and temperature grain, yeah. elements. And, and they tried to use sedimentary proxies and locational proxies uh, to try and suss out like, okay, well, these things are living in sandstones that are in deep water and they're in the South Pole. They're also living in shallow water carbonates. So they basically would give them numerical codings for how variable within many different metrics, including substrate and temperature, yeah. et cetera. Right. Uh, and that's how they tried to suss out uh, their habitat breadth, which is trying to be a proxy for what we often refer to in ecology as niche breadth, which just means the the, the sort of all-encompassing place where an animal can live in the ecospace. Okay. So, does anyone else have any comments on that? Everyone is looking at me tired and sleepy. <laughs> okay. I would have comments, but I am having real difficulty following. Okay. Um, yeah, I had kind of difficulty following the paper. Do we want to... I mean, I don't know if anybody's going to really follow that at all. Um, do you want to define what a niche is? Because I know that all, there are a lot of people out there, a lot of scientists say that talking about niche breadth and niche tolerance or niche at all is pointless because you can't quantify them. I think that's potentially yeah. a problem. Mm. Uh, in the most fundamental of terms, when you're talking about a niche, you're talking about uh, like a space in eco space that you've carved out for that an animal has carved out for its own livelihood. Mm -hmm. Like it's the it's the combination of the abiotic regime, so the like temperatures and salinity and other environmental tolerances that this animal can withstand and survive and reproduce. But it's also like the biotic interactions, any sort of competition or symbiosis. Mm -hmm. So uh, in this particular analysis, they're strictly looking at habitat, so they're strictly looking at the abiotic. Mm -hmm. They're looking only at these environmental parameters and trying to suss out uh, chain potential differences or, or variabilities in ecospace mm -hmm. uh, strictly in the abiotic. Um, so in that respect, uh, they've tried to make it a little bit more simplistic, um, which is also in a way what, um, when people do th something called ecological niche modeling, mm -hmm. which is where you take a bunch of abiotic, uh, factors and you put them, and you, uh, where of, bleh, you take a bunch of abiotic factors and you sort of map them onto the world. And then you use species occurrence data to sort of train a model to get a basic estimate of the abiotic factors that an animal can survive in. And then you use that to map out hypothetical range space. The one problem I can see with that is there might be a lot more that could survive in, but the plants it eats can only survive in a much more restricted range. So you've got the... Yeah. Well, but this is why when you're doing something like ecological niche modeling, you're approximating but never actually hitting what's referred to yeah. as the fundamental niche. Yeah. Uh, and this is, this is getting into... When you get into niche theory, as I discussed, you've got the parameters, both abiotic and biotic, that define where an animal can live as it's carving out its ecospace. Mm -hmm. um, the, the problem is that you've got... A much larger area of where it could potentially get to, but there are two things that are always going to constrain that. There's history, which is, look at kudzu. If we had never taken kudzu off of Japan and brought it to the U.S., its range would have been restricted to Japan because it never would have been able to leave the island. You're looking at me like I'm insane. What? Kudzu, 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 yeah, what's kudzu? kudzu is this horrible, horrible plant that they started putting along highway embankments to prevent erosion. Do you mean erosion. Japanese knotweed? No. Okay. Maybe. I don't know. That that, might that's be a, what we have in England. That might be what that's called, but kudzu yeah. is the Japanese name for it. And it's a, it's a plant that we took from Japan just because we thought it was fun and decorative, and we put it all through the south as, like, highway embankments and, and as beautification. And it went rampant and is, like, choking okay. out some of the southern Does it plants. have red leaves? No, uh, green leaves. No, it does not. It green, green does it have white flowers on the top? I don't think so. I've okay, never then, seen it flower. 
then we have a Japanese oh, plant God. that's different that causes the exact same problem. Okay. So the, the thing with katsu, katsu is red. it's an invasive. I don't know. It, it's an invasive. and it's, it's really, really, really bad. You can't get rid of it. You, I mean, you have to literally burn it out, and then you end up just burning everything. We, we've got the same problem, the same thing. Yeah. Well, it's the same same problem, probably different. Plant. But getting back to this this question of kudzu could have lived in all these places, yeah. and we know that now. But when it was just restricted to Japan, it didn't have the ability to disperse out. Yeah. So that's an element of history. Just it's like rats can live anywhere, but they haven't been on the islands because the islands have been isolated. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Uh, the other element then that restricts your possible niche space is biotic interactions, which mm -hmm. is what you talked about. Like. You might be able to live everywhere in the world, but for whatever reason, you only eat this one thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and because you only eat this one thing, you have to be around that one thing. And if that one thing is not there, you can't be there. It's, um, like, our it's like our neighbor kid with chicken fingers. With chicken fingers. It's exactly like chicken fingers. When chicken fingers are roaming the wild and you have to hunt them for sport... What? If, oh, if, okay. I got no, it. no, no, no. They do not actually have chicken fingers. They are eating small bits of chicken breast meat that have been sliced. To I got it. Like they fingers. they can only that kid only eats chicken fingers and so yes. okay, I get he, it. He now. doesn't actually have chicken fingers. Yeah, I wonder. Well, it's Michigan. I wasn't sure. <laughs> yeah, well, this yeah, you know, man. sometimes this this fucking state, man. Sometimes this fucking state. Uh, man. So I mean, and the interest. So the interesting thing then. Is because there's there's another layer to it which we're not which I don't think it's worth getting into. But the fact that uh, throughout your development, your niche can change. Yes, yeah. um, that is very true. The uh, work that, yeah, that's it. So you run the risk potentially of complicating, like, it's potentially complicated. But that's the only time I could see a case where you go extinct because of um, abiotic change. But. What? But was the it... thing where you can live as an adult doesn't change, and you can't tell. Oh, why you mean when like there's a yeah. massive environmental change that you technically could be fine in, but because you're a frog and you need water to reproduce, you yeah. just can't reproduce. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Hasn't hasn't there been a study on trilobites that had planktonic larval forms? Uh, and then... Yes, but the trouble is, well, there have been. Well, yeah. There, 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 there was a there's something. It's I actually the later division. Uh, there's a you, later, okay, cause yeah. I, I swear I remember you talking about it, Curtis. There, there's also something else where they're looking at trace fossils and saying that only certain groups make trace fossils and saying that these things must have had a global distribution as larvae in order to get these trace fossils across the world. The trouble is, there's no proof. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, my, my, my arched eyebrow expression so doesn't translate well into text, but, or uh, to speech, but yeah, I'm really yeah. skeptical of that statement. And I mean, and that's an interesting thing, because... That the, the 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 planktonic larvae issue is something that might affect trilobites and almost certainly affects mollusks and brachiopods, which is an interesting <laughs> given given the second paper. Um, I think the interesting thing and the reason this works very well for looking at extinctions is because we're now realizing that other than other than ecosystem, you're not going to get ecosystem collapse from biotic interactions. And when we're looking at big extinctions, you're looking at some form of ecosystem collapse. Some have still made the argument that uh, the major extinction event in the death of the uh, megafaunas, the, which are the, the really, really big uh, animals in North America and around everywhere except for Africa, might be associated with the spread of humanity. But it's also correlating with climate change. And you get a catch-22, whereas the climate is becoming milder, the humans are getting there, and you yeah. don't know which one's doing it. Good point. Or, or if it's an interaction of both, which it very could well be. Probably, yeah, it probably is. I think one of the big problems in, uh, in science in general is the quest for a single answer to explain each, each well, event. The, this, is, this is what right. I've argued at, at, at times is the chicken and egg argument of invasive species, is that... Uh, at, within a lot of mass extinction events, you also tend to see a lot of invasives. Things that stay in one place get hosed. Invasives tend to be the ones that do much better. Is that because the invasives are driving the extinction event, or the invasives invasives getting a foothold because the ecosystem is collapsing? Mm. It's a chicken and egg. One causes the other, and then they just keep snowballing each other. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's it's the it's um snowball earth issue, the albedo thing. Where once you've got snow, you're going to get more snow. There's an interesting parallel that has once nothing to do with this, but it's a good example of a out. positive feedback mechanism. Yeah. <laughs> Daisy World. Yeah, Daisy World. Things like that. Daisy World. Uh, we you were thought you were, this I thought, before. Amanda, I thought you were a biologist. 
It's been a long day, okay? Da Daisy World is the world's covered with daisies. Oh, right, right, Albedo. right. Now I remember. Okay. Go Fuck back light. and look at podcast number. No, we are not filling that in with the actual <laughs> podcast number because I'm not dredging through the records to figure out which one that was. That's right. I remember now. Listen to them all. Listen to them all. What and you, then tell us. Are you fucking what doing subliminal messaging here? Listen to them all. Listen. You will listen to the podcast. Bye, BP Gas. <laughs> I knew it! I knew it! You were just an American company. It doesn't matter. All right. You're a spy. Chips. Chips. All British chips. people are spies. I mean, we're good at it. So. Eric Estrada? Yes. <laughs> Wow, oh, that dear was a God. bad poll. That was just terrible. You and you should Awful. feel bad. What he's talking about chips, the TV show. I know. With Eric I, know Estrada. I, 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 I know that Ch Eric Estrada was on chips. I like the look of confusion <laughs> on James's face. <laughs> chips was a television show which had a cop uh, who was played by Eric Estrada, who's awesome. Why Motorcycle called, cops in California. Motorcycle. Cops. Why is it called chips? I'm sure it's, I think it's an acronym, but yeah. I don't remember what the acronym actually stands for. No. Not a clue. Cops yeah. hit Indian people. <laughs> what, the, what the What the fuck is up with you today, dude? <laughs> Besides, you forgot the S. Yeah, you're right. Peoples. No. <laughs> Cops hit Indian people severely. Severely. <laughs> really. Oh, God, we're all going to hell. I think we, I think we went there three podcasts ago. Probably. Good point. Helen back again. Helen what? <laughs> who's Helen? Helen who's again. Helen oh. back? Is she related to the composer? <laughs> God damn you! <laughs> Actually, right, so hell, the hell, hell's only about an hour from where I am right now. Wait, there is a hell, Michigan. I I, yeah. I know that. There's an eerie Indiana as well. There's, I know a, about there, eerie there's Indiana. also a paradise and a Christmas, Michigan too. Okay. So you can go from hell to paradise and back again? I bet you paradise is worse than hell. Like, hell was nice, so they just tried to name it to stop people going there. Paradise was terrible. Like Greenland. Well, Greenland okay, was a wasteland. The fair, Vikings went, we need people to go there, so they named it Greenland. We to want be everybody fair, to go there. paradise is in the UP. So okay. if, you, if you don't like snow up to your ass every year, you're not really going to like paradise. And hell is in the lower peninsula, so it's a bit more... Temperate. Warmer. Yeah, a little warmer. Stabby. A little stabby, but uh, it's it's a tiny town in the middle of nowhere. There's there's a bar there. There's how a many, place where my the, dad used to get t-shirts. What's the population? Yeah, how many? Uh, what's the population of hell? Hang Listen on, I'll, I'll Google it while you guys talk about. When I was in stuff. California, I was going through places, and the population would be like 150. Three, yeah, yeah. And I was I was going there. And I met everyone. I'm like, I wonder if you're all cousins. <laughs> <laughs> there are definitely some some towns in uh, in central California which are just really small rural towns. Yeah, yeah. that's that's why I'm currently thinking that all Americans are racist. Oh, that's okay, nice. <laughs> you're still recovering. I still, I just remember the things I saw that you could buy there. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Um, um well, it's so, unincorporated. Okay, that's Pop good. Population two hundred and sixty six unofficial. You know, actually, that I feel good about that. Only 266 this is people hundred are in more hell. This is the hundred more than the smallest town I saw in California. Well, I but, but literally... it's nice to know there's only 266 people in hey, hell. Hey, 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 Amanda, I, I know, Amanda, I Amanda, really Amanda, been... Amanda, 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 Amanda. Does hell ever freeze over? <laughs> hell oh, freezes over all the time. Every times. year, Michigan. <laughs> every year. Oh. Um, no, I mean I've been through town towns in Ohio that have like 20 people in them and you're like really it's a group of like two trailer homes and nothing else. It's okay a, there, a there are places there are places church? labeled cities in Kansas a grain silo and a caravan so yes that is, is, is true it, my dad's joke was always a city in Wisconsin has a bar and a church and that's it well, I mean, a city in London has to have a cathedral. Uh, not in London, sorry. God England. damn it. A city London. in London. London is actually about 12 cities that yeah. merged. It, it, to be fair, true. so is New York, so Chicago. Uh, but a city Kansas in England city. has to have a cathedral, which is why there's only like eight cities. Good point. Because we, we know that the word city means something. Because it means cathedral. Whereas in America, it's like, hey, people aren't dying in droves. Let's call this a city. Actually, it's <laughs> a population number. It's totally population number. Yeah, what, it is. Garden City, population seven, Kansas. 
Here's the thing, Garden City. I don't uh, think just because the classifies the town, as a city, just because the city's name might. Or the... It's kind of like changing your first name to Doctor. Yeah. It doesn't actually yes. do anything. <laughs> doctor, <Yes>. Doctor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> also, I saw I saw tons of monarch butterflies. Venture Brothers have ruined monarch butterflies for me. <laughs> <laughs> the sting of the deadly monarch. Oh God. Do you watch Venture Brothers, Amanda? Oh yes, I do. Yeah. Yeah. I I'm, I watched the three episodes that were available for free for season five, and that's where I've stopped. Okay, I'm okay. like halfway through season five. Anyway, uh, the key point that they were getting at for the paper, not to drag this all down, I apologize. No, it's okay. I just feel better talking about something that I understand. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> uh, so they did all these metrics for habitat, uh, habitat flexibility. They tried to look at how... These things are living in different habitats, and uh, they then sort of monitored it with speciation extinction rates, like they, they, they just estimated speciation. Well, they estimated, they called it diversity changes because they're looking at generic data. Okay, But yeah. they use speciation extinction rate methodology. So I guess they're just looking at the occurrence of new genera and assuming that everything is related and not actually looking at constraining it phylogenetically. Uh, that sounds a little... You, the, the trouble is, you, given that genera are multiple species that form, hopefully, a clade, having all the genera must have originated right at the start. Well, they're they're looking at. I mean, that's not necessarily. No, true. I mean you'll have ancestor species, but you're going to get massive discontinuity more so than you would with species data, unless your genera aren't real. Well, they looked at rate change of rates, and they also looked at duration of groups. And uh, what they found with their data is that they could easily check, uh, or they could easily p- uh, parse out a, um, a a length or a, a duration bias that. Every ge- uh, all the generalists were obviously um, living for longer periods of time, whereas the specialists were living for shorter periods of time. Okay. What they didn't piece out was a potential to speciate. They found that generalists and specialists supposedly were diversifying at exactly the same rate. Could I... that just be because you lose a lot of data just by not looking at the species level? Well, they mention in their in their analysis when they're looking at these factors that they did a species level analysis and looked at species richness as well, but they don't actually present the bulk data for that, and they just said that it corroborates their range size data. But I do wonder if if you just have a whole bunch of like oversplitting of groups, mm-hmm. then maybe you're, or or if you have like all these genera and maybe you have one genus of specialist that has fifty species and one genus of generalist that has twenty species, like maybe that's affecting well, things. Well, surely, I mean, I assume they had a topology. There was no, there's no, no phylogeny. No, then, there was then you can't do any of that, whether spe- generalist or, or because you yeah. don't know if every time there's all, a diversification, all... it, it's almost random as to whether they're a generalist or you don't know if the specialists are creating other specialists or specialists just constantly bud off of generalists. Yeah, th- this is this is one of the things that uh, they made an assumption and they said that their assumption generally held, but I do wonder if there's a circularity to this, where they said that um, all species within a group typically have the same uh, ecology. That's not true. That's not true <laughs> no. at all. No. Um, or, or that they would have similar ecologies. Not just that, but given the way... Or evolu- similar flexibilities, Given the say. way evolution works, you can have a genus, and the basal two members will have a closer ecology to whatever the ancestor was than the other things in the genus. At the most basic level, then you've got derived things where... Uh, randomly they might start doing different things within the genus as well. Yeah, yeah I mean, all you have to do is look at, you know, uh, genera, certain genera of sandpipers or whatever, where you get all these wonky-looking beak shapes, and you're just like, wow, completely different, all in the same group. So this, is, this was something that I was interested in, because this is when, basically, you start to have to look at the resolution level that they're talking about. Mm-hmm. Uh, because as they're looking at the, at the genus level, I, I was wondering that you could potentially, because you're just looking at, so I, I guess to back up a bit, we, through the Linnaean classification system, we've got kingdom, phylum, order, class, genus, species. Keep pond clean or frogs get sick. Kings play cards on fat green stools. Stools or stools? Stools. That sounds the same. I know. 
<laughs> so basically we have the species as the most fundamental level which is you know an, let's define a species as an evolutionarily distinct trajectory uh, of, a, of a conglomeration of multiple populations does that make any sense give an example yeah um homo sapiens homo sapiens uh, boa constrictor yeah. pongo pongo <laughs> the, the, these things are either not able to interbreed the with ones other that things, don't work or they birds. will never interbreed with the ones things. that don't work are birds because there are three thousand subspecies for each species and the species could interbreed as well yeah birds are pretty much a giant fuck you but that's because they're birds but everything else is, um, ev everything higher than the level of the species is an attempt to sort of put boxes within boxes for naming purposes. And ideally what we're trying to do when we're at these higher levels is to define these boxes so that they're meaningful in an evolutionary sense. Right. So when we're looking so at like a genus, ideally what we're talking about is an entire group of species that are all closely related, share a few characteristics because they're closely related, and don't include any things with... Then that group is complete, basically. That it, it is the beginning and the end of that group, and there is no extra extraneous it's, bits that derive from that it's group. It's like if you're trying to name uh, the leaves on a branch of a tree, and <laughs> for some reason the branch held like, a meaning for the individuals of the leaves... You'd want to name all the leaves that were on that branch that one thing, and you wouldn't want to lump leaves from another branch on the tree into that. Yeah, right. Yeah. And you also wouldn't want to name the base of the branch one thing and the tips of the branch something else, right. because then you're arbitrarily defining when you have actually named that. Mm -hmm. Right. And that one thing at the base is not meaningful because it's not easy to define. So, uh, in, in more technical terms, we're looking at trying to find a clade, which is just a group of species that includes the ancestor and all of the possible descendants. Uh, now, the levels that we're talking about when we're at a genus versus a family versus a phylum, what, what do you... What? Can you name all the members of the descendants? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Milo. Don't! <laughs> <laughs> Man, there, there's like five people who are like, fuck yeah, the Descendants. <laughs> <laughs> Too bad none of them listen to this podcast. Yeah, about right. Yeah, really. <laughs> yeah, but one of them makes this podcast. <clears throat> Man, do we include the... I mean, there's like a few people that were like doing backup work who are in all... Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I just snorted onto my mic. Well, at least but you used the distinctive mic. Oh, mm. Anyway. So... Uh, when you're looking at these, where was I? When you're looking at these <laughs> levels, it was well, it was well played, sir. When you're looking at these levels, like the genus versus the family versus the order, um, we're kind of in our heads. We're defining these things as being like generally larger groups versus generally smaller groups. But there's no hard set rules or delineations for what actually constitutes a genus or an order. Yeah, they're just they're they're means to an end to give a shorthand to naming things and to understanding the basic evolutionary groupings by basically looking at these larger clades and then subsets of these larger clades and then subsets of these clades and then subsets. Yeah, right. It's kind of a communication thing. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, while I would say, uh, I personally, I mean, I'll, I'll fit things into a Linnaean kind of hierarchy. I will name suborders and whatnot. But other than species, it's all very subjective. And while I think the genus has a utility for trying to bandbox the most closely related things, anything higher than that is becoming very, very subjective. Because the only two things that really correlate are the things either side of a bifurcation on the phylogenetic tree. Things outside yeah. of a bifurcation. Yeah. So basically, um, species, terminal taxa. Um, so if you've got, you've either got two species next to each other, or if you've got uh, three species, it'll be the two species next to each other, and then that other species and the ancestor of those two species. Okay. I think an interesting element when you're looking at diversity patterns and you're suddenly having to look at the genus level is that it becomes really problematic to look at these actual rates of diversification. Because when we're typically when we're looking at like rates of what typically with the species level we're looking at speciation and extinction. Well, I guess in, in, at the genus level we'll be looking at diversification and extinction. Uh, the problem that I have is that you can have a clade go extinct, but a clade can't give rise to another, to another clade. clade. No, right? Because by definition, a clade has to include its ancestor and all of its descendants. 
So if a clade gives rise to another clade, it's not a real clade. Yeah. The other mm-hmm. problem that struck me, and that they don't do this because they don't look at rates of evolution, they just look at rates of extinction and uh, speciation. I guess they don't look at rates of evolution. Uh, they don't actually no. have any. Well, but they don't have a tree. No. They, well, no. We need exactly. a phylogenetic tree. And to you couldn't do, do it at the genus level anyway because the genus is probably going to be only one or two characters different from the other genera. And then there'll be each species will just accrue more and more characters within the genus. So it depends on. I mean, the reason I can see you using genus and the reason why I can imagine they're suggesting that the genus is useful to do is because if you miss species within a genus, as long as you get the first and the last, it doesn't matter. If you get gaps of species, because each species is its own self-contained unit, that's going to lead to gaps that can influence your rates a bit. But it should be random sampling, hopefully. So but I think that's why a lot of people say that if you use genus, you're taking average of all your species data for that group, and that's why the genus is okay to use. Yeah, I think what they're what they're assuming there is that uh, when you're looking at the genus level, all you're really going to be doing is muting patterns. It's going to be a conservative underestimate because you're looking at basically assume that you take an entire group, like a, a swath of species, a, a clade of species, and assume that you only just picked one of those. And then you do all of your diversity estimates using only one of each of these smaller groups. Mm-hmm. Then they're just assuming that you're going to be muting the effects of these of, of of each individual clade. Uh then I think also an element of that comes that some people slant that as being really beneficial. Some people state that you're going to remove all the error that comes from problematic taxonomic sampling that species are oversplit or we really don't know what a species is and so everyone has a different idea and that because of that species level data is poor. Well, it's, it's just people have, there have been a couple of papers out recently in PNAS where they've modeled things. This was in PNAS. Compared it to, the, yeah. Oh, no, 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 not, not this one. The, sorry, the other one was in PNAS, yeah. not this one. Um, and what they've done is they've modeled species and genera and they've looked at the data compared to actual data and they say that genera are better because when you look at species diversification, it's not significantly different from random, but genera form a pattern. That's problematic though, because what if species definite what if what if speciation is ultimately random? Yeah. Yeah, really. That's like looking for a pattern and trying to just pick the level that shows a pattern because that's what you expect. Plus, right. plus if yeah. we're really thinking about this, since genera are ultimately I love the, the designation of a genus. Like you could have a genus with one species, you could have a genus with fifty species. Yeah. Because it's ultimately us looking at it and imparting a little bit of our own bias saying this is weird enough, we should call it a new genus. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, because of that, isn't there the potential that we're manufacturing a pattern? Well, I mean, they said, that what, they said that one of the things is that a genus tends to have an average lifespan. And what that is, is that after a while, things are going to accrue enough changes that you're going to look at it and think, well, it's 50 million years later, this can't be the same genus, it's got these changes, I'm going to call it something new. Well, they seem to have a lifespan. What do you mean by that? That there is an average time since the origination of a genus before the genus doesn't exist anymore. I think, but that's true of nearly everything except for possibly phyla and kingdoms. Yes. Yeah. I, I mean, this is this is just, what this is, is that you can How have large, you large scale yeah. evolutionary dead ends. Like, this is getting back to, I remember this was a quote, I don't remember where the statistics came from, but it was in a Niles Eldridge book. He was talking about someone else's study that said, like, 98% of all people will not have an air, will not have genetic air like within 100 generations like generally speaking everything gets pruned your genes disappear and it's a very f- select few that persist yeah mm-hmm. that's just kind of always been the way and that's the way it is at the sp- at the higher level as well that you get these huge swaths of variation throughout the evolutionary record and just a few exemplars make it through I mean, the, just, uh, the sad thing when you think about it is the ones that persist for a long time is when you just, how far back you define on the tree, eventually it's all going to stop existing anyway. Yeah. Was, you're going to yeah. get to the end, even, even like the basic thing of all life, eventually you're going to hit a point where unless we get off the planet, stars going to go Nova and boom, it's all gone anyway. Well, even then you run into heat death of the universe anyway, so. Well, if it just keeps expanding... Um, assuming that the universe is a closed system, which it might not be because there's it's possible true. multiverses, life will just be very shitty. It will be slime molds living around a dying star, but life will still be there. 
Oh, hey, we had slime molds in our front yard. I know, you said you last mentioned it time. last yeah. podcast. Oh, okay, I don't remember. I didn't <laughs> it's remember okay. when I I'm, that. I'm, okay, I'll do a deal with you, Amanda. You show me pictures of slime molds, and I'll show you pictures of all the birds I've seen, including uh, condors, uh, Clark's Nutcracker. I've uh, seen those, they're awesome. Plenty, lots and lots of things to show you. I was photographing, I've got goals and toeys catching flies on a beach as well. Yay. So I can show you all of that. That's right, thank you for reminding me to pull the slime mold pictures off my dad's okay. camera. So, uh, so should we take a break now, or what? Should we end on the eventually all life is going to die? Yeah, I like the yeah, idea of ending. Yeah. Eventually all life is going to die. Okay, so, let's uh, perpetuate our futile existence a little bit more by eating some food, and then we'll get back in about ten, twenty minutes or so. Yeah, sounds like a plan. But okay. for you, instantly. <laughs> Uh, the book says collared doves, so in the east we saw tons of collared doves. Yes, they're, they've really, really started popping up in yeah. the desert southwest. Yeah. Hmm. So I don't know if they're competing with anything. but No, not really, I okay. don't think. Well, that's good. So the sparrows and the collared doves are sort of benign invaders. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Much like the British. The, ben- <laughs> the British, the benign invaders. The benign yeah. invaders. We just go there, make the place a bit better, and then give it back to you in 200 years. <laughs> Well, that's there worse is, than Hong Kong. There is so so that's many how they things. teach it, huh? <laughs> but no, we had Hong Kong for a hundred years. We don't actually talk about 99. imperialism at all. We're not taught it at all. Seriously? Yeah. Like, like we're taught about a lot of the horrible shit we did, like Vietnam and the Japanese internment camps. No, literally, camps. Uh, history in England is, you know, you do the Romans, you do the Black Death, you do the Tudors, but you only do Tudors in England. You don't do the wars of, abroad. Uh, you'll do the uh, Plantagenets and the, like the, the 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 war that led to the Tudors. Um, then you do World War Two. Okay. okay, that's it. That's we- okay, okay, that's interesting. We go from we, 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 colonial we, we, era. Well, as far as well, here's the thing: You're, we, we divide it up between a like old world history uh, for I think two years, and then like a colonial history for two years. America does not appear in the English history textbooks until World uh, War II. until they turn up in World War Two. Yeah. yeah, wow. And, and then they turn up, and they turn up late, and they help do the landing. But we were probably going to be okay anyway. <laughs> and the only reason they joined is because the U-boats kept sinking their shipping vessels. That was well, no, that no. was World well, War One. Well, the only reason they joined Pearl is because of Pearl Harbor. Harbor. <laughs> but the only reason they invaded Europe is because uh, FDR had already got pissed off at the Germans and been trying to convince the Americans that war was necessary for years. He had. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that is true. There were people who were running off to Canada to enlist because the U.S. was not a part of the war. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so after that brief history lesson, do we want to start again so that Amanda can go and get food, because I feel so bad about keeping you from food. Uh, well, also my battery's going to die soon, so... Okay. Yeah, it's okay. I don't think we have much else. Do we have anything else to talk about? Well, with the second paper. Yeah. We sort of glossed over the second paper the first Do you want to do it in we depth? Do you want to talk about mollusks and why... The, well, Mollus- no, I mean, the mollusks, mollusks are the paper pretty we... cool. Huh? Mollusks are pretty cool. Okay, but it was just bivalves. Well, no, that, that oh. was that was the one that we were talking about with the habitat differentiation. Okay, what was the Ordovician one? The Ordovician one just looked at uh, truncation of environment versus paleo latitudinal extent, and tried to see whether or not paleo latitudinal extent was a meaningful uh, way to show survivability. And it's an interesting idea to think of it ecologically, but the, I think the the key issue that you come back to with this paper is that because you're looking at the genus paleolatitudinal paleo, uh, extent as opposed to the species paleolatitudinal extent, aren't you potentially just looking at groups that are living in larger areas versus groups that are living in smaller areas? Right, like, so is maybe... It nece- is it necessar- does it necessarily have to be like an intrinsic quality of the species, or could it just be luck of the draw in this case? Like you have a whole bunch of little endemic species uh-huh. that are in a billion different places as opposed to could be. them really being widespread species. Maybe. Well, what? So maybe what we should do is take a step back and say, what would be the ideal way to do uh-huh. to test what they're looking at? To te- Well, what they're looking at in the fir- in the in that first we'll, paper we'll talk with the about that, and maybe we could talk broader scopes about quant- studying mass extinctions. Sure, we could we could do that. Sure. Uh, I, I think that we we need well, to uh, we need to go back and damn podcast. I think. 
we need to go back and well it can be this damn podcast but anyway <laughs> i think we need to go back a bit and uh just sort of clarify that the second paper the one with the mollusks which we discussed fairly in depth yeah i mean granted it's a large enough paper that we could go far more detailed into what they actually did with their data but uh in a general sense we hey guys welcome back continue I don't care. I was <laughs> just gonna like we, we already said. I guess we got to start. So I figured yeah. I was just gonna cut from there. Okay, continue. Yeah, let's keep that in. That'll be good. That'll be really yeah. great. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> I, I bring the comedy, Curtis. Now continue. Thank you, <laughs> um. So yeah, I, where the fuck was I? <laughs> yeah. I think it's important to remember that the first paper, the the Ordovician paper, which we touched on briefly. Uh, I I thought it was interesting to associate it with the other paper, but it's not exactly like it's trying specifically to push one agenda or another. Uh -huh. But it is specifically using paleolatitudinal extent as a kind of proxy for environmental tolerance and habitat breadth. Uh huh. All right. And I guess an interesting question is so so there the other paper argues that you can't do that because you're conflating a little bit of geographic range in there which I agree with. Uh, and uh, so I, I guess one thing that we can discuss is, can I is there even more problems potentially with using paleolatitudinal extent given the resolution of the data that they're looking at? I guess the one thing to, to, to say here is that the pattern of increased range leading to a buffer of extinctions only seen at the genus level. You don't see it at the species level. Part of that, that is because species don't vary across paleo latitudes very much but the genus will and so the thing is then if you see it at the species level it's almost certainly going to be related to range size rather than paleo latitude because they don't vary paleo latitude all that much uh, uh, latitude all that much you mean individual species yeah all right um but it's interesting that, that this this big um this big discussion about uh, range size and uh, latitudinal gradients is a pattern that has only been retrieved while looking at genus level data, partly because very few studies have used species level data and those that have have been restricted to basins because of the amount of sampling that's needed in order to get at that. I think an interesting question then is everyone assumes to some degree that this is representative of either either happenstance that you just have a group that's big enough that occupies multiple areas and your habitat gets fucked but you can mm -hmm. still survive that's mm -hmm. one interpretation i think that's uh you go like classic stanley's interpretation uh -huh. for for range size being equated to uh, extinction but uh if you start looking at uh some of these other things with like assuming the paleolatitudinal extent is some way habitat breadth mm -hmm. but can a genus have a habitat breadth? Well, the trouble is, you'll probably find that um, you've got species in there where their habitat or their niche doesn't I, overlap. I just, want, I just want to clarify really quickly that because a genus is a clade, it's it's an element of history, not yeah. an interactor. A species can speciate; it can create new species. A genus can't create new gen new genera because a genus is just made from the agglomeration of species yeah, yeah it is just a sum of its parts no more no less i, I so, mean i guess i guess you could make the argument that a genus habitat breadth is the breadth of all of the species within that genus but that seems really no i i agree I, I, that that is the only interpretation that, you could have exactly um, is that meaningful yeah yeah well, that's, the trouble is you'll probably find that a lot of the species, the species, their, their habitats won't overlap. Within a species, that might be the same case, because a species' habitat breadth is only the sum of its individuals and its populations. Right. I suppose. Yeah. Uh, but there is... I mean, now we're, now we're getting into whether or not like the fundamental niche is reducible to the population, yeah. or is it reducible to the species level? The trouble right. is, they will, they'll, they'll, you can almost definitely get a genus where there are some species that have one habitat and another species that have another habitat. They're very different habitats. They don't overlap at all. And oh, that's absolutely. why that's why having a broader scope for a genus will lead to survival during extinctions. Um, for but, a... but is that is that meaningful of anything other no. than happenstance? No, it's mm -hmm. meaningful for the individual species, but yeah. the species either go extinct or not. You know, it's not meaningful for the genus. It's, exact, it's exactly as you're saying. It's chance of history and chance of what happens to be within that clade. Right. Uh, I mean, I guess one could make an argument if you're if you're looking at this with the genus as being a 
closely related ideally. I, ideally, we're defining, defining this as a group that's very closely related as opposed to defining mm-hmm. a genus that's maybe very broad. Uh, we're defining these clades that are closely related and that if environmental tolerance is directly inheritable, then maybe it suggests that certain clades are more constricted within their potential regime of environmental tolerances and certain clades are more variable, more able to occupy many different regimes. I think the problem with that is that in order to test that, first off, you have to do it at the species level. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You have to be able yeah. to break the yeah. genus down into a con- its constituent parts to see how the interactions are going on. And second, you have to be able to ignore... We talked about the two things that are going to be limiting the uh, ecospace, either the biotic interactions or the historical interactions. And I think it's very important for you to piece apart whether or not these things, these individual species are going in different ecological directions and it's associated with major biogeographic changes as well. The other big problem is you'd imagine, because a species is a definable, hopefully a definable discrete unit, that that the species niche is not likely to change massively over its lifespan but because the gener- genus consists of multiple species, as they speciate, they might start tracking uh, different gradients because they're because a, ge- a genus has a, a longer lifespan because right. it's multiple species. So it might have a better chance of survival because as things speciate, their niche changes. Whereas an individual species, it's not going to change its niche; it'll go extinct. But its descendant species or its sister species well, might. Well, and I, and I think hmm. in a more fundamental sense that uh, I'm gonna. That feel really bad about this, but I guess the only example I can think of off the top of my head is my own goddamn research. Uh, I'm going to, with, specifically within the Ordovician, if you were looking at changes in paleolatitudinal gradient through time within groups, uh, within the Homolonotids, they're mostly like high latitude and they're, construct, they're constrained to the Gondwanan distribution, but there is a very basal split, which is associated, it, it t- roughly temporally associated with the splitting of Avalonia off of Gondwana. So Avalonia is the little micro, uh, microcontinent that basically includes Ireland and England. And uh, Gondwana is this massive landmass of Africa and parts of Asia and the Middle East. And uh, during the Ordovician, that's pretty much seated directly on the pole. It, it has some extents that go up into the equator, but the area where Avalonia was was right near the pole. Mm-hmm. And uh, that starts to rift off and just slowly drift towards the equator. Now, there is a pattern within the Homolonotids of a push towards the equator, but all those things that are, are, are ancestral to Avalonia. So those things just happened to be in Gondwana. They accidentally got rifted off and moved equatorially toward, uh, moved equatorially because of this shifting island arc. And all of that really has, well, I guess, never mind, I'm getting myself caught up into <laughs> stupid minutia. The, the key point here is that it was through no, like, major evolutionary innovation or no faculty of the group itself. It was just happenstance that it was on a piece of rock that got rifted mm-hmm. away, moved equatorially, and we have a pattern of what looks now like a group with a massive paleolatitudinal distribution, and that's why it survived. Uh-huh. Ah, so uh-huh. all of these things are in the same genus. Uh this is not this is um this is two genera, but Okay. If we were, if we we're like one of these, one of these genera is potentially polyphyl, uh, paraphyletic. Oh, okay. I get it. I get it now. So it grades into the other. It grades yeah. into yeah. the other. Um, the other thing as well is if you look at um, distributions of species, they are going to be smaller than the distribution of a genus. You can, by happenstance, have a globally distributed genus or something that goes across, uh, either circumvents the world, or has massive paleolatitudinal uh, ranges. If something was to happen, like say. The Earth heated up and the equator just became inhospitable because it's so hot, or an asteroid hit Gondwana and the entirety of Gondwana was fucked. If you're a species, you're only likely to be living in Gondwana or wherever. If you happen to be there, you're fucked. But at the genus, because each species has its own ranges, but they're scattered about, you're more likely as a genus to survive because you're everywhere just because of how you're defined. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I mean... yeah. To be fair, like if you are still a clade, that means your clade is surviving. Uh, I think the argument here, or the potential problems here, is that but because what if the clade is defined arbitrarily, yeah, because you could be a, you could be a genus with three species that are all in the same basin, or you could be a genus with two species, one of which is in Antarctica, the other one's in the equator. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. You could be a genus of five thousand species, yeah. mm-hmm. like the beetles. <laughs> yeah. Beetles. 
because it's it's merely a boxes within boxes yeah. scenario of things that we think look close enough to each other. Like at the at the end of the day, taxonomy and taxonomic naming is kind of gut instinct, at least or at least it, it, it's still based upon gut instinct. Mm-hmm. Like we think that this looks decent enough. Or di- different and decent enough. Different, different enough, enough different to enough. actually necessitate. You fail to meet the qualities of a species. <laughs> so sorry, you're not actually a species, old boy. Uh, well, you're a blob. You're a new species. So that it looks distinct enough to potentially be called a new genera. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, that's something important that everybody has to always keep in mind, that this is a human construction, essentially, and we like order. We like now, how would you to, respond to the, uh, I think the response back would be, what about the species as a human the species, construction? The species, I would say that you, there are definable characteristics that you can look at, but when you get further back, especially like we were saying, back into the, the larger and larger groups, it gets a little bit touchy. The thing is, you should be able to tell a species because you've got multiple concepts, either What's I mean, my the one the way I look at it is that it's got a beginning and an end, so you don't know it's a species definitely until it's gone extinct. Um, a lot of people would say that's not true at all. Um, you've got the biological species concept, which means it cannot consistently produce well, viable offspring. Viable offspring. You're, you're looking at a, 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 <clears throat> a modified version of an evolutionary species concept, which is that a species is a unique evolutionary trajectory yeah. that's not going to enter, that's not going to go back into any other trajectory. Yeah. That if you can right. imagine like populations constantly interbreed back and forth, like a weave that's being, we- yeah. you know, like various strands uh, that are being yeah. weaved together. And if you were to take that cord, cut it down the center and split it in two directions and those weaves never come back yeah. again, then that is a speciation yeah. event. And those two individual yes. cords are now species. But the uh, but the, the logical conclusion to that is you'll never be sure it hasn't gone back until it can no until it's just physically not possible anymore because everything's snuffed it. Well, yeah, the interesting yeah. element to that is that ancestral that, species that, that is that is very agnostic to like the the requirements of the biological species concept. Like the biological species concept T- tries to be functional to that idea. It says, "How can we tell that these things are never going to get back together again?" Well, they can interbreed. Well, the trouble is, you uh, most populations are never going to get back together because they're scattered across different continents. And but that, they yeah. could interbreed. That's the interesting thing is that if they never would interbreed because they're so scattered and they become distinct evolutionary entities, then they are new species. Yeah, but at what point mm-hmm. do you find that? And that's what I think is happening with birds half the time. You're getting splitting because they never interact, but. I think people are identifying things that will be species given time, but are not yet. Well, and then you get into the entire concept of ring species, which is just completely fucked up anyway. Well, then I I think another interesting element is that given enough time, if enough change, if you could have substantial changes that are constantly happening uh, in the modern, but like, let's say that in the long term, these things are still going to eventually end up back together again. Mm-hmm. Then mm-hmm. that means that there could be these wild periods of variation that maybe don't last for very long in a geologic sense, but in the modern, it makes it look like there's more diversity, mm-hmm. more diversity than there actually is. I mean, you also get the issue now with with um, genetic identification of species, the concept of cryptic, cryptic species, where they are exactly the same, but they appear not to be interbreeding, even nested within the range of the species. But what that is, is that's populations. You, yeah. You've just got a population with no interchange at the moment between the, the broader species. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And to be fair, that could potentially lead Become to a species. reproductive isolation yeah. and sympatric yeah. speciation, basically. Yeah. I mean, it, it wouldn't be sympatric in like the classically defined sense of it necessarily being competition. Yeah. But it would be sympatric in that they're both in the same place. So the big question is how much interchange do you need on average between populations for them still to be one species? Because most populations are going to be very, very isolated. But over geological time, there might be quite a bit of interchange. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. And this is the argument uh, that uh, the Grants had with the Darwin's Finches model: is that they actually made it. Uh, they they made the argument that there's so much interbreeding going on within these finches that they're actually that they're suggesting that the interbreeding is just a messy part of the speciation point. Mm-hmm. That interbreeding is just another side. That that it's there. You're in the middle of speciation and things are messy. I do wonder if maybe it's the other way around. If these things aren't quite diverged enough to be species and they're interbreeding because they're going back to each other. Mm -hmm. But they make the argument that the interbreeding is actually pushing them away. I can actually see that argument because a lot of the times, especially in things like warblers and um, other passeriform bird groups, you'll get hybrids. And for whatever reason, that first generation hybrid is 
it just never mates. Either it's sterile or it it can't sing correctly or the plumage is wrong. Yeah. And it in, just... in these cases, the hybrids are actually valid. I think the issue is that uh, as as they're going towards very like distinct morphotypes, the hybrids hybridize somewhere in the middle of those morphotypes and offer up another morphotype. But the trouble mm. is, is but then birds, that morphotype birds, is by not and large, valid, or at least songbirds have what is essentially a lock and key mating system because it's right. all audio audio based and if your song's yes. wrong you're not going to attract a mate so it's well, interesting that... that for the finches that they are attracting mates and you're getting viable offspring out of it and that suggests that they're the same species but it's just highly morphologically variable to me but, uh, that, yeah. you, but if you're going by that then you have to call every single warbler in the u.s at least in the eastern u.s you have to call that a single species too because you're getting the same thing happening with the with the hybrids but the but hybrids, the hybrids, are, but the hybrids viable. are viable but yeah the hybrids aren't viable these are they oh they are okay yeah. um i mean the interesting thing as well is you've started getting different races where you got or rather they had different races where a lot of birds had western and eastern races and now the split of species this is also leading to a higher occurrence of bird extinctions because things that we didn't used to consider species were now considering species and then they go extinct. Yes. Yeah. To be fair, yeah. like uh, bird species are are. I mean, then, okay. The, 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 let's get back to that argument from. Well, you got uh, you you got your carrion crow, hooded crow, and then you've got the two two mile buffer zone where you get hybrids constantly along the buff- the range. But let, let's but, actually let's go yeah. back to that argument that they make in the first paper that the the potential problems with taxonomic splitting or at least for how you're defining your species could cause error. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So if you're looking at birds, maybe things look more specious than they actually are. But I don't think using the genus level is going to correct for that. It's, you're just causing different problems. Yeah. I agree with that. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> I don't think that that's an ar- I here's my 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 exact argument against that is that taxonomic issues are just as bad if not worse at the yeah. genus level. I mean, if you want to yeah. do both, look at both and I'd be very interested for people that do species level stuff to then look at the genus level, which they don't do to see if the patterns that you see in the genus level hold up even though they don't hold up at the species level. Oh yeah, because that would indicate that there's potentially a, a genus level bias in terms of boxes within boxes. The other thing which has just gone straight out of my head <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, in terms of hopefully with species level data, because there are more species, you can. This is going to sound like a shit in, shit out argument to some degree. You can swamp it with data because there's more species, and hopefully any error will come out in the wash. But you do need to. You need to pay attention. You can't just throw shit in and hope you're going to get a pattern. I know what you yeah. mean, but it does totally sound like you're playing into the hands of the people who make the argument that species are just too shit to use. Yeah, but they're not. Yeah. This is the thing. I mean, you, what it comes down to is when you do any study. First of all, uh, this is something that you said in the email. Like, are these studies viable? Yes, but you need geographic range. You need a phylogeny. You need to know how they're related. You need to know what's going on at the time geologically as well. Those are the minimums of what you need to do any kind of macroevolutionary study. No one does all three because it's a lot of work um the other thing god damn it, it's just gone out my head again the things that you need for macroevolutionary <sighs> studies we're not getting are... back to wales because disney will sue us what <laughs> what the fuck did he just say you're not speaking whale not oh speaking god whale. Um, no, he's speaking Goliath. From yeah, I'm okay. Speaking, I'm speaking this is Goli- it. Exactly. The other, the other thing you. is, the, reference. the other thing is, oh. it's, it's good to. You need any time you do something like this, you need to at some level understand the basics of the thing you're working on. You need to understand the group at some level. The taxonomy. You, you need to yeah. have a basic yes. understanding of the species. You, you and... need to be able to make a judgment call, which comes down to again, a, it's it's a person thing. It's an individual thing, and this is why there's always going to be error. But you need to p- feel comfortable. Science looking... is an individual thing. Even when you're doing yeah. nothing but data crunching, you are still making yeah. assumptions and biases. Yeah. Because we're yeah. all people, and we're all flawed, and we're all approximating something that's out there, but we're never actually getting it. Exactly, yep. but yep. what you can't do is just to sh- throw everything in willy nilly. Go assume it's all correct. You need to make judgment calls because you need to know a bit about the group, and then you need to justify and explain so that people can disagree with you. You can't just have a table with pure numbers. That is definitely true. Justify all of your choices. Justify all of your assumptions. And actually, that's one of the things that in that first paper, 
And also uh, the second paper. The second paper was constrained because it was a PNAS paper, so it was a little shorter. Yeah, yeah. There's but, probably about twenty yeah. pages of supplementary material. Yeah, somewhere. yeah. They, they both they both did extensive uh, justification of the things that they did, and were very transparent about the problems of their assumptions, mm-hmm. which yep. is something that I really respect. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I often feel really... like when you start to obfuscate that kind of stuff, and you start to uh, or, or or you slant things in a certain way without being honest about what you're talking about, that that's really really shitty. Yeah, and these. Yeah. Guys we're right up front saying like there are potential problems with using this at the genus level. However, we feel that this is still biologically meaningful. They gave their list of reasons why. Um, they Which, did throw in that one that one quote from another paper, which was that maybe the genus is better than the species. Yeah. Went, no. I mean, but that's, that's the same problem we had last time, last podcast, with the yeah. they say it's a paleosol. There are seventy papers discussing whether or not this is a paleosol, but they don't. You know that was bring never that up at all. Yeah. Up, you know, no. I mean, th- in this one they do. Yeah, like, this one yeah. they bring up the arguments for and against. Yeah, um, and I think macroevolutionary studies, which is essentially what we're talking about. I mean, some people don't like the concept of macroevolution as a, as a viable field. Um, no matter what you do, if you look at anything that's at the species level, you're starting to do macroevolution. Specifically, um, when you're starting to look at biases within the species level, like and if you're, you're look- looking at things like that certain groups have more species versus certain groups I have less I think if you're species. looking at morphological change between species, you're looking at macroevolution. You're le- you're looking at the how how. So your argument is that pretty much the majority of cladistics is all macroevolutionary. Yes. Okay. I would say yeah. it, I would say it certainly is because you're looking at because um, whenever you do a cladistic analysis, you're looking at relationships of things at the species level or higher, and then you often have a discussion about why certain things are like they are, and it might be very rudimentary, but you're starting to get to macroevolution levels. Same if you look at anything functional, and you're looking at, say, changes in, in limb morphology uh, along a lineage, you're looking at changes in limb morphology between species, and you're starting to do macroevolution. You're just looking at the building blocks and the foundation biologically, rather than the abiotic side and the and the broad scale patterns, which is what most macroevolution focuses on. I, I would because make a, I would actually make an argument that macroevolution can go both ways. Like you can you can look at biotic interactions macroevolutionarily as well as abiotic reactions. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, I, I think macroecology is like a good example of potential large scale biotic interactions. Yeah, as as a field of study. Yeah. Um, whether or not ecologies have lock and key mechanisms that hold them together, or whether or not they're all mm-hmm. scattershot. The importance of importance or otherwise of invasives and competition. Yep. Um, uh, they, they actually one of the things that they discuss uh, in that uh, in that paper with the with the mollusks when they're getting to uh, if generalists and specialists don't actually speciate, well, diversify all that much more. What mm-hmm. are potential other reasons? And they come up with like potential competitive examples of. Specialists compete better than generalists. Okay. Because um, oh. they're highly specialized to their environment, and that's why they persist. Well, okay. So that they'll always outcompete a generalist. But then my thought just immediately went to kudzu. Well, I mean, <laughs> or, or the European starling. Yeah, it's a generalist. It can survive pretty much anywhere, well, and it beats the shit out of everything. Well, here's the thing. Yeah. You, can, you can be a specialist, but if you find a generalist that's an asshole, like the Starlings, it's going to beat you. <laughs> and it will beat you. Here's the thing as well. A lot of the time, generalists will outbreed specialists. That's the key there. The fact yeah. that you could throw out yep. more offspring that will survive, and even though you're competing with something that's very good at what it does, there's just more of you. Yeah. I mean, uh, maybe and, and maybe maybe asshole. we maybe yeah. we personally are conflating a problem. We're conflating invasives with generalists. Yeah, and maybe well, that, that's a personal bias. Are all invasives generalists, they, or maybe, are they specialists? They don't have to be. Yeah. Well, like, like I think one of the really interesting elements, and this is something that that Mollus paper touched on, which is something that Verba really liked, uh-huh. was that you can be a specialist. <laughs> Sorry, she just kicked out of that top. That's okay. That's okay. Sorry. <laughs> you can be a specialist with a really big range. Yeah. And this is why they wanted to divorce the paleo latitudinal thing because you could be an anteater. Yeah. An anteater only eats ants, but ants are fucking everywhere. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's everywhere. Well, not everywhere, but it's in a very yeah. large range for a, but, I mean, a specialist but, feeder. But when do you want to say something's huh. a specialist or not? Woodpeckers need trees, or they don't need trees because some did uh, put their beaks in the ground and lick ants out of their holes. But it's got a highly modified system. Its cranial casing is such that the brain essentially floats in suspension. Uh, you know. Now we're getting also potentially to a point where 
we as human beings like to look for patterns. We are pattern seeking people. Yep. Uh, we are animals that like to put boxes within boxes. Yeah. And when doing that, do we potentially look at things and say, wow, that's a really simplified shovel shape. It must have been a generalist because that's exactly. just an assumption. How many apomorphies that... before something becomes a specialist? Well, I, yeah. I, and I, I do wonder if we just look at things and anthropomorphize them because we know that a simple tool is general and a specialized tool looks complicated. Well, people also like the story of this thing was really good at what it did, but then some dick came along and it just couldn't compete anymore because I think that's I think that's the human condition everyone yeah. really needs that beach bum story of that guy who comes over kicks over your sandcastle and steals your girlfriend yeah starlings would do that starlings would totally <laughs> kick over your sandcastle and steal your girlfriend I think the, starlings I think, are dicks I think the key to starlings is first of all they're oily as fuck so you can yeah. light them on fire they're like the Spanish and um we're cutting that and um <laughs> The main thing, though, is that they're almost impossible to kill. Um, there was a starling. It was struck by a kestrel. Then it lay on the ground, twitching, and a gull came over and pecked the fuck out of it. And it pecked at the gull, flew off, flew over a reservoir, fell in and finally drowned. It was like the Rasputin of starlings. <laughs> <laughs> Poison so, shot, shot stabbed. stabbed. At least the stabbed and the drowning part were there. <laughs> yeah. But well, I mean, if, if a cat really. if a cat bit it, the poison could have been there too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, so, it's it's the the concept of in of invaders as generalists. I'm trying to think back, and and most of the invasive species that I can think of in North America, zebra mussels, starlings. They are generalists. I think the idea is that you have something that has a very small geographic or relatively small geographic range than it could possibly live in because it has an environmental tolerance yes. that's very large. How much are we saying this This only lives in this one forest, it's a specialist, versus this thing which possibly has a more specialized way of feeding that you find globally is, is a generalist? Well, I, I think I think we're better at defining that sort of stuff. As yeah. I said, we can distinguish the anteater as obviously yeah. being ecologically a specialist. specialist. It only eats if, ants. If not range specialized yeah. yeah not range specialized so uh, i think geographic i'm just referring specifically geographic yeah, range size yeah. here that okay your invasive pattern is like here's this one thing that wasn't really doing all that much in its own habitat and but left to out. its own devices when it gets out yeah fuck but i think there's also yeah. a disconnect Burmese between Python. okay assuming that at some level um generalists are more likely to become invaders than specialists are not all invaders are detrimental to wherever they go into. If you look at sparrows and collar doves, for an example, if they've come into America, they've done almost nothing. But sparrows, you look... sparrows have... Uh, they, they've been a, not as aggressive as starlings, but they are somewhat aggressive, um, but they're nowhere near as bad as starlings. I don't know anything about collared doves. I don't think they've done shit. And part of that, part of that is because we wiped out the passenger pigeon. Um, they don't that's... flock like passenger pigeons, though. Well, no, but you're you're, and it's kind of yeah. the same thing with um the invasive pigeons, the uh the rock rock pigeons. Um, again, you're you're dealing with something where you have this, you had this spe, well, relatively well, actually, it was just pretty much a specialist with these massive flocking passenger pigeons, and they're all gone now, and that's just empty. But then they're gone because we shot them, not because they're out repeated. No. no, exactly. <laughs> that's my point. That's Can't my point. Because we shot him. And that's, yeah, and so some of these so things that are currently invading wouldn't have had the chance because everything was already occupied, and now that it's vacant, you're seeing an expansion. Exactly, exactly, yes. I mean, that that's, again, when I'm getting to that chicken and egg argument yeah. of invasions yeah. during mass extinctions. Is it mm -hmm. you know, the invasives causing the mass extinction, or are they opportunistically taking advantage of it? Yeah. And right. probably a little of both. Actually, didn't Sabretooth's... Didn't Sabretooths do quite well during the land bridge? Yes. yes. You mean yes. as far as like the North American interchange? Yeah. Now that, yeah. that most people consider a specialist in terms of ways of hunting. And that managed to expand its range. Well, uh, yeah, that well was the, the, the placental mammal saber teeth did really well. The marsupial saber teeth kind of got their ass Because it sucks to, to be a marsupial full stop. Well, yeah. okay, that that argument has been slightly refined. Like, yeah, Ver Verba went in <laughs> to look at that, and there's actually some interesting, like, uh, s some ecological elements. To Forest it. rastids make it north. Yes, 
Yeah, the, <laughs> that the ranges that the North could actually occupy were still in the South, but mm-hmm. the type of ecologies that were up in the North weren't there for the South. Uh-huh. So yeah. the, 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 the Southern things just stayed where they were because there was no reason yeah. to passively expand. Yeah. 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 Yep. Yeah. It wasn't like they just saw the opportunity and there was like a massive lineup of the two animals and they fought bravely <laughs> until they pushed the South back. It's like, it's like the 300. They just sat on Mexico and like, you cannot pass. This is a <laughs> narrow valley. <laughs> this oh, is madness. Passed. This is South America. This is, just, this is just a bunch of buff marsupials. Buff marsupials. <laughs> wearing bronze <laughs> armor. Yeah! <laughs> I, have a, I don't have a placenta. Yeah. Fighting the placental mammals. <laughs> Coming through Panama. Um, you know what? I'd pay to see that movie. You know what? Sci-fi will probably make that. So. Sci-fi would make that movie. <laughs> so, we better uh, get royalties so, uh, for that. So, Asylum Film Productions, yeah. we're expecting that check in the mail. It's okay. According to Discovery Channel, there are still saber-toothed cats somewhere in the jungle. Oh, God. Ay. Well... I'm afraid my battery is about to die, so we should probably what? wrap up if we have any say, last words. Put down words. timestamp 144, oh. but anyway. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right, sounds good. Um, so yeah, uh, I guess after that rambling discussion that I don't think really went anywhere, and... Uh, People realize that this is difficult. People and that, realize this is difficult. And that, so and that far, you make certain trade-offs when you're doing with either uh, yeah. mode of... And that it's still study. it's still a developing thing. I've got a very clear idea of what I think a study would need to really test this. I don't have the means to do that, and I think everyone has the same problem. I think so, yeah. too, and we're dealing with the best of what we have. Yeah. So. Yeah. Anyway, I guess that'll do it for yeah. uh, this two weeks. Uh, I've been Kurt. Randall. James. And Amanda. And we're signing yeah. off. Can't you just eat a sandwich? No, because I'm up in my room. Why are you in your room? Because mom's watching TV downstairs and dad will be taking over his room whenever he gets home from golf. Can, can sandwiches not move between rooms of the house? I don't want to eat on my bed. Don't you have a chair? No, uh, I no, don't. You want to no. You want to fucking see the room? Okay, look. Fine, I'll see there's, your room. There's the window. I look, remember bookshelf. That Lots and lots of fucking bookshelves. And there's the door, okay? I don't have any fucking room in my room. My room is, like, barely big enough for the bed.